Oh, who left this on page two? How dare you? Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you today. Let's stand and sing together.
Thank you for joining us, whether you're here in the house or whether you're joining us online. It's just such a privilege to be able to spend this time together to lift up songs of praise. I just want to join with you today in, in worshiping God for everything that he's done for us. Let's continue singing.
come to you today, all of us from, from different places, all of us coming off of different weeks. Lord, we all have different obstacles ahead of us. So Lord, I, I pray today that when what looks ahead of us seems insurmountable, we would remember that you move mountains. That we would come to you just with what we are, what we have knowing that it's not nearly enough, but we give it to you. Lord, today, we give you our all. To follow you. To be made new, to be made like you. That light, that, that light would shine for the world to see. Lord, may we never forget your unending love for us. Your abiding love. May we never forget what you've done for us, that we could have life in you. Lord, we ask that you bless the time that we share together. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'd like us to just dwell on that last line for a little bit. Why should I gain from his reward? You know, there's, there's no answer to that. So much of what Jesus did, especially there at the end, was not for him. Was of no benefit to him and was only for us. And I think that every week when we take communion together, that is also something that was meant for us. It's not, uh, not so much something that was put in place just to show God's glory or, or to praise him, but to benefit the ones who were doing it. When Jesus sat around the table and he, he broke the bread and he passed it out, it wasn't because he was hungry. It wasn't because he needed a reminder of what was about to happen. It was because we did. It wasn't because he needed to know and, and speak about the new covenant, about the promises that would be fulfilled when he shed his blood. It was because we did. Jesus didn't take the bread and, and break it and eat a piece. He broke it, and he gave thanks to heaven, and he passed it out. Now, I'm sure that he was there with them, and I'm sure that he ate with them together. But something interesting that he said as he passed out the cup, he passed the cup around the table. In Matthew chapter 26, he says, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you, in my Father's kingdom. See, we do this, we do this every week. We, we do this as part of, our, part of our celebration, part of our, our commemoration of what God has done for us, what he has given for us. We do this every week as we gather together. But we don't really see any indication that, of when that started, like which week, which week after Jesus' resurrection did they start gathering on that resurrection day, that first day of the week? When did they start gathering and taking the bread together? It certainly wasn't the very next week or the week after. See, while Jesus was walking the earth, he was around for another 40 days after, after his resurrection. And we don't see this happening because he has said, I will not do this until we do it new in my Father's kingdom. Because it's not for him. This is not, it's not uh, an act of, of worship to the one who died. It's an act of remembrance of the life that was given. This is not a sacrifice that we make. This is a remembrance of the sacrifice that he made. It's for us. And so when we do it, we don't do it casually. Though we do it often, we take it seriously. Because it means the world to us. It means life. It means freedom. When Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He says, as often as you do this, he says, whenever you do this, remember me. Remember, he said, my body, which was broken. Remember the price that was paid. Let's take the bread. He also passed out a cup. Interesting that he would choose two different symbols because there were two different things to remember. Not just the price that was paid, he said, but this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Not just remembering what was the blood that was shed, but the promises that were fulfilled in it. Looking forward, not back. 
forward to when we will do this together again, new in the Father's kingdom. And what a day that will be. Because when we do, we do it with him. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, what a beautiful reminder we have, both of of what you have sacrificed for us and the victory that was won for it, the new life that we have in you, freedom from guilt and sin and death. Lord, this is such a privilege to be here and to do this together. Lord, it's a privilege that, that we do not hold selfishly. It's a privilege that we want to share with the world. Lord, would you grant us whatever it is that we need, whether that be the time, the courage, the resources to bring more into your kingdom. Lord, we pray that we would use what we can, what we have, to further your cause in this world. Lord, we pray for uh, for peace today. We, We ask that you bless our time together, and we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. My name's Mike, if we haven't had a chance to meet just yet. Um, we are glad that you have uh, taken your time this Sunday to, to join us for worship. As, uh, <clears throat> along with our remembrance of the sacrifice of Jesus, we each week, we also take an offering. And so if you would, if you came prepared to give today, there is a, a box in the, on the back wall there that you can uh, place your gifts. If you'd like to participate in today's offering but did not come prepared to do so, you can use our secure online portal at cchmd.com slash give and, uh, and make your uh, contributions there. Uh, we are uh, grateful for, for each and every gift that comes in. Uh, we're able to use that to further the gospel and further the mission of the church, uh, both here in Hagerstown and Washington County and across the world. Uh, uh, one, one announcement, David, don't go too far because I may need you to verify some stuff here. Uh, coming, uh, this coming summer, our high school students are going to go to a week-long uh, uh, camp experience that's not like our typical camp. Uh, it's, they, they hold uh, uh, these uh, week-long experiences at different uh, ca- uh, college campuses across the nation. Uh, uh, Skay and I remember going to them growing up. Uh, David uh, went to them grow- growing up as well. It's a Christ in Youth. It's a, a, a ministry out of Joplin, Missouri, and uh, their, their motto from the very beginning has been, change youth, change the world. Change youth, change the world. And so they offer all sorts of things from uh, mission trips uh, to uh, middle school and high school experiences uh, and even uh, some elementary experiences as well. And so, uh, the, but, but the cost of, of these experiences is, is, is not is no small thing. Uh, there's some travel to get there. Uh, there is uh, the, the the expense for each student to register and, and sponsors to register as well. And so, to help try to offset that cost, as a church body, uh, the, uh, the the youth who are going are going to uh, supply for us a spaghetti dinner. I believe, right? Spaghetti dinner because spaghetti is easy to make and local and gives them uh, some, some 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 margin to which we can help support them and so the date for that is April twenty eighth is it right after service. Sunday evening, Sunday evening, April 28th, we will be having a spaghetti dinner. Now, uh, so, so what we want is we'll have some information coming out here soon. There will be a, a cost to help offset that. So you can invite friends and family. It'll be, uh, uh, but we, we, we want to uh, gather as many people as we can. Uh, that way we can help uh, defray as much cost for our students who are going and the families who are sending uh, their students uh, to this because it will be a life-changing Experience. It was at one of these uh, weeks that I uh, felt God's call into a full-time service, full-time ministry. And it was one of those things where I kind of felt it before, but it was, it was God kind of giving that, that two-hand shove going, this is where you need to go. It was at one of these experiences uh, that uh, I felt called to go back to the Philippines for an entire year. And uh, after having gone on a, on a week, long, a month long trip with Christ in youth. And so uh, the, 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 the people who they have, they bring in are uh, amazing speakers, um, who, uh, amazing uh, worship leaders. It is, a, it is a great week that will really touch 
all of the hearts of our students who will be going uh, to this. And so um, w- w- whatever you can, if you, if you can help support that, uh, April 28th, uh, we will be uh, having this. And so um, be, uh, be, be uh, and, and, and maybe you think about who, who do you want to invite? Who do you want to make sure you're there? Uh, how do you want to help support our youth in sending them to make sure they are able to experience uh, this week together? And so um, the, that week that they're going is June June 10th to like 14th, something like that. Yeah, so, so that, week, kind of that week of June 10th is, is, is the week that they'll be going. And so be praying for, for those who'll be going. Uh, and uh, that will be, uh, I, I, I am sure it'll be a life-changing week for each and every one of them. And so uh, be praying how you can uh, help them with that. And so um, uh, before, uh, uh, to, uh, as always, if you would at some point during today's service, uh, pull out your phone and go to our connect page at cchmd.com slash connect. Let us know where you're viewing us from, whether it's here in the house or online. We are glad uh, that you are able to join us wherever you are uh, today. This week, as always, there'll be stuff on our Instagram feed and our Facebook page that can continue the conversation of what we started today. So please uh, stop in, uh, like those, comment on those, share those. Uh, the more we begin to share that we, the more opportunity we get to uh, begin to uh, gain some traction and uh, maybe uh, get some of, uh, uh, it might be a way for us to be able to invite those who are around us, invite those, uh, those who we are already in relationship with uh, to, uh, to encounter and experience Jesus among us. And so uh, be doing that as well. If you want to follow along with today's sermon notes, you can do so in the YouVersion Bible app. And today's sermon is called The One Where We Enter the New Covenant. The One Where We Enter the New Covenant. And so uh, today we're wrapping up our covenant series. And so there's, uh, we're going to kind of bring all this to a close uh, and today. And so uh, we are very excited about that. And so uh, to, before we go any further, let's pause and go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you that you have made a way for us to be restored to you. Father, we thank you that that as you have lived in covenant with us from the very beginning, that time and time again as we've broken each and one of these covenants, that Father, you've not left us alone. That Father, you continue to pursue us. You continue to seek us. You continue to find us. You continue to uh, make a way for us to be restored to you. And so Father, I pray that today, Father, I pray that today that we would experience that. Maybe for the very first time, maybe a renewed sense of connection, a renewed sense of purpose, a renewed sense of, uh, of connection with you, Father, you would uh, meet us in this place. Father, we'd be aware of your grace. Father, we'd be aware of our own sin and lostness and that you would help us to, to, to find new life and new faith in you. Father, I pray that you would help uh, instill in us a desire Father, you would light a fire in us to share this hope with others. That, Father, no matter where they might be, Father, no matter how far from God they may be, that you would help us to, to begin to, to drop breadcrumbs, to build a bridge from where they are to where you are so that you and them can meet and they can encounter you in a, in a powerful, powerful way. Father, I thank you that you came, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us, for the sins of the world, that, Father, we might have hope beyond what we see, hope beyond our present place, that we might know, be able to know and experience life together forever with you. Father, we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. I remember when we bought our first house. Uh, it was early 2000s. We were living in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. And, and I remember from where the church was, uh, we wanted to live in a certain area. We wanted, to, uh, we wanted to live outside of the county where the church was because uh, the, the, the prices were higher, the, the, the taxes were higher. I'm like, if we can live just over across the county line, that would be better. It, it would also be better because it'd be, uh, Skay at the time was interpreting in the, in the public school system. And so it'd be just to give her a little bit closer drive to the school that she was interpreting in. And so like, if we can find a home in this area, in this price, it kind of meets the parameters of a house that we were looking for. And so we looked and we looked and we looked and we saw house after house after house. And finally we found the one and we, we put in an offer and it was signed here, initial there. Sign here, initial there. Sign. And, and, and then we got the house. And closing day came. 
And it was sign away your first child here, initial away your second child here. Sign, and so we, we, we filled out and we signed, and we, we signed up for 360 consecutive monthly payments so we could have the privilege of calling this house our home. There was a ceremony, there was a process, and there was a result. We lived in the house for a few years and we sold it and we, we, we've done that process a couple of different times. And there's every time there's a, ceremony and there's a process and there's a result. I remember our wedding day, October 6, 2001 in Longview, Texas. There in front of friends and family in the, in the sight of God, we stood up in front of the church in fancy clothes and we made vows to one another until death do his part. It was exactly 22 and a half years ago yesterday. I, you're like, wow, Mike, you did the math. I, I did kind of do the math. I'm saying like, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I remember, and so we, we, we stood there, and, and it, was a, it was a beautiful day. It was a, it was a windy day. It was a picture of a scale almost having her veil blown off of her head. In the process to get from not knowing one another to our wedding day, there was a process, there was a ceremony, and there was a result. That is still reality, as I said, 22 and a half years later. I remember many of the things about the day that I was baptized, uh, November 11th, 1984. I remember uh, that it was Veterans Day because uh, our church uh, gave out little Gideon's New Testaments to all the members of our church who were in the Air Force. We were living in Myrtle Beach at the time. At the time, there was an Air Force base there. And, and so I remember uh, many of the men dressed in their uh, dress uniforms on that day. And they came to the front and we, they gave them these New Testaments they could carry with them wherever, wherever they were going, wherever they were serving, they could have the word of God with them. I remember that day because it was after days and weeks and months of struggling and wrestling and resisting. that Finally, I answered God's call and chose Jesus as my savior. The, the, the building that we were meeting in uh, was a rented building. It did not have a baptistry. And so we had to use uh, uh, someone else's uh, pool. It was a, uh, one of the members of the church. He, he owned a hotel on the beachfront. And so there in a beachfront pool in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, I was baptized. Now, don't get any ideas. It, it was warm. It was November. That water was plenty cold. But there was a process. There was a ceremony. And there was a result. Over the last month, we've talked about the different covenants that God has had with man. And each one, there was a ceremony, there was a process, and there was a result. And, and each time, we broke the covenant. Each time, uh, man broke the covenant that God, had with, that God had made with them. All of them were based the same, though. They were all based on God's grace. God, God pouring out his grace on them, accepting them by grace all of them were accessed by faith. You didn't just get it because you're a certain way. You, you were accepted into this covenant. You accepted the covenant. You made an agreement with the covenant by faith. And each one was put in place to prepare us for the coming of Jesus. Because in him, all the covenants that God had made with man from the beginning of time until now would find their fulfillment in him. Each one prepared us a little bit more for his coming, a little bit more for his arrival, a little bit more for what was next. And each one we had broken, and so a new covenant needed to be established that prov would provide a cure for our sin. It would provide hope for a restored relationship with him. See, we, last week we talked about how God established how he initiated this new covenant. And today, as we close our series, we're going to talk about how we can enter into that new covenant with God. If you would, turn with me to Romans chapter 6. We're going to look at the first four verses. Uh, the question that Paul is going to start out this section with is going to draw, is going to be based on conclusions of what he has just said about grace and our justification by faith. He, he knew that what he said, that there would be some who would take a radical view of grace that throws the law of God and a pursuit of holiness 
out the window. And so here he begins. He begins to reject those distortions of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer would call, later call cheap grace. And he does so by pointing to our entrance into and the symbolism of entering into this covenant with God. If you would read with me the first four verses of Romans chapter six, Paul writes this. What shall we say then? Shall we say, shall we, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Uh, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Paul starts here with a question, a question that is based upon what he has just said in Romans 5.20. What Paul says, he immediately begins to confront the objections to the language of what he just wrote. He wrote there in Romans 5.20 these words. He says, the law was brought in so that the trespass may increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So some might say, you know what, if we want more of God's grace... All we have to do is sin more. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes supply and demand. More sin, more grace. I want more grace, so I must therefore sin more. And Paul's like, no, 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 you guys are getting it all wrong, right? You guys are, you guys, you guys are missing the point. Because by, by thinking of it that way, why pursue holiness? Why should we pursue Christ-like living? Yeah, but that's what you just said, right? The law was giving, given so we could just, so it would show how much we need God's grace. And if I want God's grace in my life, that must mean I need to sin more so I can get more of God's grace. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. So he, he, he confronts and he says, what should we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Shall, shall we continue? Should this be our life? And from this question, it sounds like the verb is the word sinning. Shall we? Shall we sin so grace may increase? Well, what's interesting is that word sin, quick grammar lesson for all of us today, that word, the word sinning is not a verb. It sounds like a verb. It's not a verb. It's a noun. It's a noun. So it's, it's really what it says is, shall we continue to live in sin? Shall we continue this pattern of sin? Shall we, shall we keep doing this, this sin-like things? Shall we, shall we, shall we, so this is the word, the, the, the verb is, this, is, is go on, it's continue. Shall we, shall we live in this pattern? Shall we remain doing these things? Should this, should this be the qualifier, the, the, the adjective that would describe our life? See, the reality is we will continue to sin, Right? We will continue to sin. We established that last week. We established, we established that many weeks, right? We, 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 we sin frequently. We don't have to practice sinning. Sin it just kind of happens. But the question is, is it something that just kind of happens in our life? Or is it the dominant uh, thought? Is it the, the, the dominant uh, power in our life? See, God's grace will continue to cover our missteps. It will continue to cover our transgressions. It will continue to cover our sin. But the question refers to the measure of control, the measure of a lifestyle or habit in our life. Paul's like, we should no longer be dominated by. We should no longer be enslaved to sin, just as God's grace just so that God's grace has reason to increase in our life. What should we say? Should we go on? Should we continue to live in sin just so grace can increase in our life? Paul's rejection of this stance, of this statement is strong. He says, by no means. By no means. It is two Greek words for no slammed together. So think of the most emphatic way that you have ever told someone no. Think of that. That's what Paul's saying. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's like, no, absolutely not. No, 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 no. And if I need to add another no, there's another no. Paul's like, no, by no means. We are those who have 
died to sin, how can we live in it? How can we continue in it any longer? Shall we go on sinning? So we can experience more of God's grace in our life? I want more of God's grace. Paul's like, no, that's not how it happens. By no means. Absolutely not. No, no, no. We have died to sin. We cannot live in it any longer. We should not live like this because we have died to sin. Therefore, we can no longer be ruled by it. And it's not just that some part of us has died. You know, as we get older, maybe we, we, you know, we're not as spry, we're not as athletic, we're not maybe not as strong. Maybe there are some things that we used to be able to do that we can no longer do. It's not, it's not like that. It's not like the loss of a relationship, a friend who's moved away, who's passed away, who, who we've just grown apart. It's not that kind of loss. It's not just that we've lost some part of our body. No, what the change that is, happens in us in this moment is so distinct. It is so powerful. It is, it is, it is so encompassing. It is so radical that the only way that Paul can describe it is by death. We have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And throughout, throughout Paul's writing, he often paints this picture of, an old, of the old man and the new man, right? The old man is characterized by sin. The old man lives in sin. The old man is driven by sin. But the new man, uh, the, the new man who's raised up from the watery grave of baptism, he's a new man. He's got new perspective. He's got new priorities. He is different. And so this picture of old man and new man, there, there is this deference that, that Paul says it can only be described by the death of the old and a rebirth of the new. He says that the disparity is so great that it can only be described by death. He says, we have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And so Paul saying without saying, he says, if you continue to live dominated by sin, if you continue to live in sin, you don't fully understand grace. If you continue in this way, you don't fully understand grace because grace is not just about forgiveness. It's not just about our justification, right? It's not just about God putting us in right relationship with the law. It's true, Right? Grace is the foundation for our, the forgiveness of our sins. Grace is, is what, what helps us move from, not, from guilty to not guilty, right? right? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That happens by grace. We can't, do, we, we, we can't work hard enough. You know, it's not like we, we can go out there and go, hey, God, I'm going to really buckle down today so you can give me a bonus, and that bonus is going to be your grace. That's not how it happens, right? I'm going I'm to work so hard that God's going to say, hey, man, you've been working hard. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you in the end category. That's not how life works, right? No matter how hard we work, we still sin. We still fall short. There's not enough that we can do to cross that line and go, you know what? God's never going to look at a man or a woman and go, hey, you know what? You've done so much. You have earned your way to heaven. It's not going to happen. That's why it's all by, based on grace. It's a gift. Free gift, unmerited favor, grace given to us. It's our justification. But grace is more than just forgiveness. It's more than just justification. Grace is a double cure. It's not just about our forgiveness. It's also about a change of our very character and the very nature of our being. One of these things happens immediately. When we accept Christ, when we go through this process, when we accept him as our savior, we are immediately given forgiveness of our sins. We are immediately declared not guilty. We are immediately moved from outside to inside. We are in Christ. That happens immediately. But the development of Christ-like character in us is a process that will take the rest of our lives. Sometimes a maddeningly slow process process. Have you been there? You've been there where like, man, all of a sudden there's times and there's periods where you're making leaps and bounds and you're growing and things are 
like exponential rate and you're like, man, I feel the presence of God in my life, in my being. And you're like, this is amazing. And then sometimes you kind of wonder, God, are you, are, are you done with me? Because I don't feel like I've gotten there yet, but I also, I also, I'd like to make more gains. I'd like to grow a little more. And sometimes it's maddeningly slow. And we'll take the rest of our life. Is a continual process of regeneration, of dying to self, of living for God. If you are a Christian, no longer can you continue to live in sin. Sinning cannot be a habitual part of your lifestyle. While sin is still present in our life, sinning ought to be behavior that is out of character for us. It ought to, be, it ought to continue to be the exception and not the norm. Why? Because we have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So when does this change begin, right? But when does this change begin? Like if you sign up for a, 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 like some workout classes, you can go, hey, I got to feel in, I got to be in better shape back then because that's when that process started. And look, I started doing these things. And all of a sudden, I can start seeing the results. Maybe you were like, hey, when did, when did my financial picture change? You know, you went back then, I started putting money away in a savings account and a 401k. I started uh, treating money the way God, using money the way God des- designed us to use money. And, 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 and all of a sudden, God has blessed me financially. I, you can look back to a point that I made a decision right then. When does this change begin to happen in us? And Paul has a very clear answer. He, has, he says, do you not know that we were all baptized into Christ? Dang it, 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 happens, it happens in baptism. It, 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 in, in this moment, all of a sudden, we, this is when we enter into this covenant, enter, enter into this relationship with Jesus. And there are some who will look at this and they'll say, well, when Paul wrote this, he was not thinking about water baptism. Um, one, the word baptism only, always means water baptism unless it is specifically mentioned in Scripture. Unless some other baptism is mentioned, it always refers to water baptism. And, and water baptism always re- refers to an immersion of going under the water. That's what the word bapt- baptism means. The word, the, all the words around baptism, baptized, it means to plunge, dip, immerse, put under the water. That's what the word means. Oh, well, Paul's not thinking about water. What other baptism would he be talking about? He's talking about baptized into his death. According to his text, Paul's like, there's, there's no such thing as an unbaptized Christian. Paul says baptism is this entry point into a relationship with Jesus. It's the entry point into this relationship that we've been calling the new covenant The covenant that was purchased with his blood and sealed with his resurrection. See, there's a small preposition. The word into is quite powerful. Four four letters in one word. And it clearly delineates a movement from one position to another. From the outside to the inside. From out of grace to into grace. From guilty to to not guilty. Now, before we get ahead of ourselves, there is no special power in this water. Though, as you walked in today, you might have smelled, hmm, it smells like we have a jacuzzi in here. And that's a good sign because until this week, the heater in the baptistry was not working. So if we wanted to have a baptism, it would have been a fast one because they've been baptized straight in the Washington County Aquifer. And that thing, well, that was cold. So I walked in today and I smelled a little jacuzzi smell I'm like, oh, we have heat. We have heat because we are delicate little flowers and we don't want to be baptized in ice cold water. We would prefer a little bit more of a therapeutic kind of feel when we're in there, right? There's, other than that, there is no special power in the water. The, the fact that it occurs at baptism is not man's idea. It's, it it is, is a matter of God's free and sovereign choice. 
There's nothing even significant about going under the water and coming back up, right? How many of you have taken a dive into a swimming pool? Yeah, in that moment, did you enter into a life-saving relationship with Jesus? No, there's nothing significant about diving into. How many of you have wrestled in a pool and been dunked? How many of you have been dunked by an uncle, like almost unmercifully, like just just over and over again, like you were like 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 in a washing machine, right? Did that did that alone? Cause me to enter into a life-saving relationship with Jesus? No. No. There's nothing significant about going under water and coming back up. Have, 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 you ever, have you ever had one of your babies, as you're washing them, like slip under the water briefly while you've been bathing them? Because those are slippery little suckers, right? You get a little bit of, you get some baby soap on them, and you're, they're like a greased pig. And you just, like, ah, and they're there, Right? Were they, were my children saved in that instant? No, they were not. Because, and my microphone's about to fall off my face. Hold on a second. Too animated, Foster, too animated. The fact that it occurs in a ceremony, in a process of going under the water and coming back up is a matter of God's free choice free and sovereign choice that in those moments in, in, in those waters, in that moment, he's de- designated a starting point of a saving relationship with Jesus. And one should not separate those two actions. One should not separate those two actions because if they do. We begin as if the connection between the two is somehow irrelevant between baptism and the connection to the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. Well, it is a simple act, something powerful and significant happens in the moment of baptism. Remember, something so significant that the only appropriate word that Paul could describe it with is death. That we die to sin. And so when someone dies, we make preparation to bury the body, right? We make preparation to bury the body. And Paul says we were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. In baptism, we symbolize the death of the old man by going under the water. We identify with the death of Jesus. We are buried as he was buried. As as Jesus died, so we must die. And this is why we cannot continue to live in sin, relying purely on grace. Because that is inconsistent with dying to sin. We, we, we still rely on grace, but it's not just like flippantly going, I'm going to do this because grace is going to increase. No, we've died to sin. We rely on grace because we still sin, but that must not be the defining characteristic of our life. So we'll step back for a second. If we separate baptism from entrance into the new covenant, according to this passage, to put it anywhere but in that moment, the question becomes, when do we die to sin? According to this passage, to put it anywhere but in the moment of baptism, denies baptism has any connection to the death and resurrection of Jesus. But by connecting baptism and death to sin in a cause and effect relationship, this not only, this not only puts special emphasis on the act alone, but on the spiritual working of God. It's not just going under and coming back up, but in this moment with our faith and going through the process that God has designed in this ceremony that he has initiated, God's special spiritual work begins to work in our life. He graciously performs it in conjunction with a physical act so that we might rise to walk in the newness of life. So the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned here, not just as an analogy of our own spiritual resurrection, but as a foreshadowing as a foreshadowing of our future resurrection when he comes again. 
The, 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 to walk in the newness of life is, is a continual goal. It's a daily decision. It's a daily process. It means to live in a holy life. That this whole purpose of dying to sin is then to live fully for God. See, nature abhors a vacuum. So does the spiritual nature as well. And so if we choose to die to sin, but, no, but do not replace it with holy living, sin comes back all the more. So when we die to sin, we must take the, that, that realm in which sin once reigned in our life, and we must replace it with a daily full pursuit of Jesus as our Savior, as Jesus as our Lord. See, that kind of life, that kind of life cannot continue, cannot, cannot encourage continued sinning. Paul goes on to say that those who have died to sin have been set free from sin. That sin has been rendered powerless in their life. In fact, sin has been made ineffective by removing its power and control in our life. And while sin no longer is in control, it still rears its ugly head, right? Still rears its ugly head. The remnants of sin will remain until little by little we place all areas of our life under the lordship of Jesus. That our past habits and hurts and hangups will all be like little beachheads for sin to exert influence in our life. Yet their power will only win when we yield to their temptations. See, those of us who have united ourselves with Jesus have effectively died to sin and now live for God because baptism breaks sin's bonds. Because baptism breaks sin's bonds. As we've said, there's no magic power in the water. There's nothing special in the water in the tub behind me. But the power of God applied to the life of the believer through their faith as displayed publicly has great power. Not just for the one who's being baptized, but those who are there to witness it as well. See, our faith was never meant to be private. It was always intended for public display. Whether it's our, our entry into the covenant relationship with God or, or a continued pursuit of him, it was always meant to be done within the sight of others. Certainly there are practices. Certainly there are uh, things in our faith that we are meant to do in private, just one-on-one, -on -one, not for the show of others, but the fruit and the result of those practices all ought to be done in the sight of others. Our declaration that Jesus is Lord ought to be done in the sight of others. Why? Because you might need to be reminded one day of your commitment to him. One day you might be yielding to sin's power and temptation, and you might need someone else to come along and say, remember, we have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? See, this means both, of our, success, both our successes and failures are on display for all to see. Our successes are shown not, not for our own glory and for our own fame and for someone to go, attaboy, that's how it's done. But our successes are on display to show the power of the grace of God in the life of those who believe. That what was impossible for us on our own is made possible through the power of God at work in us. Our failures, our shortcomings are on display, not for our shame, yeah, not for our downfall, but as evidence that we are still in process. See, there are a lot of people who think that God demands perfection. That, that God demands that, that we uh, are never sin. And if we do, it puts us in danger of the fires of hell. But nothing can be further from the truth. Throughout the pages of scripture, God continues to use broken and flawed individuals to accomplish his will. The same process has been used from the very beginning of time, and he still uses it today. In the words of Paul to his friends in, in Philippi, he, he goes, though we have not obtained it, we continue to strive for perfection in Christ. We're not better. We're just forgiven. We're not perfect, but we are being perfected. And we have found hope outside of mere human effort. And what we could never achieve on our own is being realized in us through the power of the Spirit of God given to those 
who believe in Jesus, who have placed their faith in him and have been baptized into him. We receive, at, we receive all this at baptism because baptism breaks sins, bonds. Maybe today you are living outside of a relationship with Jesus. You're still living outside of a covenant relationship with him. And today, today can be your first day to take your first step to make that relationship right. You can choose to come to him, to repent of your sins, to die to your sins in the waters of baptism, and to rise to walk in the newness of life. You can choose to repent, to change your mind, to change the direction of your life, and to walk in his way. You can choose grace over human goodness. And by choosing his grace, you will receive the power you need to overcome sin and to live for him. Maybe today, you're like, I've already been baptized. I've already entered into that relationship, but you still feel the presence of the old man. The, The old man of sin keeps rearing his ugly head in your life. And today I'd like to remind you of the resurrected living that we've been called to, that we recommit to that, that we have died to sin. How can we live it any longer? How can we daily pursue holiness? Not that we're perfect, but that we allow God's power to continue to perfect us. That each day we choose to die to sin and to live for him. That each day we would choose, hey, see, how can God use me today to help nudge someone just a little bit closer to Jesus? How can God use me to build that bridge to someone who is still far from him? How can God use me to make the world around me a place that might be more accepting of his love and his grace? May we give ourselves fully to him so that he might use us to help others find a way back to them. That their faith journey, their pursuit of faith might lead them into the grace of Jesus. May we help lead others as we have been led to choose Jesus as our Savior and to receive his grace. This is the commission of every believer to help others find their way back to Jesus. We're all in process. None of us is perfect. None of us is perfected. None of us has made it. We're all in different places on the journey. We're in different places on the map. We have, we all have, there, there, there are certain places of all of our journeys that are just going to be different from other people, but we all have a s- common starting point. When we meet our Heavenly Father in the waters of baptism, where we die to the old man, and we rise to walk in the newness of life. We're in different places on our journey, but we all can take a step forward today. Maybe today the next step you need to take is apparent to you. Maybe like, that is where I need to go. That is a step I need to take. And we'd love if you would share that with us. We're, we're, we're going to uh, have an invitation song. So if the band would like to come and, uh, up to the front, we're going to give you an opportunity uh, to, 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 to respond publicly. Maybe the step you need to take can be an encouragement to someone else today. Maybe the step that you need to make be an encouragement to someone in the maybe someone at home. Maybe you're like, Mike, I, I'm, I don't feel so comfortable coming up front. That's okay. You don't have to. You, you can still let us know. That way we can still pray for you, still help, help uh, resource you, still help you grow in that. And you can use the connection card at cchmd.com slash connect. Mark the box that is most appropriate to the decision you need to make today. See, baptism is not the last step of the journey. It's the first. It's the commitment. It's the starting point of a new relationship. See, in baptism, we die to our sins, but we rise to walk in the newness of life. And so as we either make that choice today, maybe remember the time when we made that choice long ago, that we begin to walk out that faith from there and that we might walk in the newness of life to go and to make Jesus famous wherever we go this week. I'm going to pray for us. 
We're going to stand and we're going to sing. And if you need to make a decision here today, we'd love to meet, meet us here in the front. Uh, some of our elders will be up here uh, to meet you. We'd love to pray with you and help you as you continue to grow in your faith. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he died for us in our place and rose again so we might have hope beyond our own goodness. Because, Father, on our own, we cannot succeed. But in your spirit, Father, you are continuing to make us and remake us into your image. So, Father, maybe there are some here today who need to make this choice. Maybe there's someone at home who needs to choose you as their Savior. Father, would you give them the boldness to step out, to meet you here in this place. Father, to begin uh, that part of the journey of choosing you, of repenting of their sin, of turning from their brokenness and rising to walk in the newness of life. Father, maybe for many of us in here, I see that we, we've already made that choice. That is already a decision we have made. We've already committed to that life. Father, would you help us to recommit today to resurrected living? Father, you, we'd allow you to remake us. We'd allow your grace to grow in us. And that, Father, as your grace grows in us, Father, would you help us? Would you help us to, to, to reach others who are still far from you? Father, we thank you that you've saved us. We thank you that you've done the work to save the world. Would you empower us to go and help us reach others to know you better? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us about the hope found in the name of Jesus?
We have victory in Jesus. Our Savior forever. He sought us and bought us with his redeeming blood. Pam comes forward and she's like, I just need to rededicate to that. I just need to recommit to that. Many of you know Pam's physical struggles she's been going through. And that can wear on you. That, 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 can, that can pull on you and, and, and cause a lot of energy to go to things that maybe take your eyes and thoughts and focus off of Jesus. And she's like, I, I need his presence. I need to recommit to that way of life. And so maybe today you, 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 you're, you're like Pam as well. So maybe Pam coming forward is your commitment as, as well. And so we're going to take a moment and pray for Pam. And, and pray that, that, that all of us today going forward can live out of that life just a bit more. That, that might represent who we are and what we need in um, our heart more day by day. That we're not perfect, but we're being perfected. It's not about our goodness, but it's about his grace. And so let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have saved us. We thank you that you have purchased the price for our sin and that your grace covers us. And so, Father, we pray for Pam because she says, I need more of that in my life. I need to be reminded of that. I need to live more out of that uh, today than I did yesterday and more tomorrow than I did today. Now that's about our effort, but Father, it's about us leaning into your presence and allowing you to work more faithfully in us more fully in us. And so, Father, would you today, would that be all of our prayers, that you might be more present in our life each day. And that as we live out of that, Father, would you continue to grow us towards you, that you would help grow our church here as we represent you to our community. Father, would you empower us to serve you each day. Father, we thank you for the grace that has saved us. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, we are glad that you've joined us together today, that we've been able to gather together to sing praises, to be reminded of the hope that is in the name of Jesus. May we go and make him famous this week.